Hey guys, welcome back. This exercise is the image sampler part two. I'm trying to keep the videos relatively short and limiting them to about 20 minutes each. So in the previous video, part one, we looked at an image sampler, dividing a surface and then putting a series of circles with a number of different radiuses to it, controlled by the image. In this exercise, we're going to use the same script with a few modifications and we're going to create a 3D surface as our facade. So I've got our previous script up and our previous exercise up from video 4. However, I've gone back through and labelled everything, which I highly recommend you do. It's very important. So what I've done here is I've double clicked and used shift and squiggly button for the scribble or can be found up in the Prams Utilities Scribble. And then for each of the other components, you can select it, Control G, right click and give it a name. So base surface, divide surface, sun path conceptual, which is that line I drew, sun location, which is the point on that curve. Circles on the facade, image sampler, rotate circles and create circles, create surfaces from circuits, which is disabled. We can copy and paste everything that we have up there, bring it down. I'm just going to Select it all, right click and turn the preview off. And then I'm also going to delete our conceptual sun path and the last four components here. We're not working with circles anymore, we're going to be working with a surface. We have our base surface, we have our divide points, have a series of planes. Now what we want to do is take these surfaces and we're going to move them in the y direction, which if I draw on the screen is going to be in that direction, moving out from the facade. And the distance that these points move out is going to be controlled by this image. And then we're going to use that series of displaced points to then turn that back into a surface with some three dimensionality. Let's start by putting down our move component. We know we're going to take these points and we're going to move them into the Y direction, or the negative Y. We've got a series of numbers, so we can always start with the remap values as a, as a our distance. So we're going to take these points. We don't actually need that. And we're going to move in the y direction. So we're going to get a unit y. Just type y into the canvas. And you can see all our points have moved into the y in the positive direction. So I can actually type in negative and put a negative in between to change that direction. So now we're moving in the way that we want it to. And we want to control the move by these values. If I turn off the original divide surface, there's an angle there. You can start to get a glimpse of some pattern forming. It's hard to tell because we have. Wait, let me set up my screen. It's hard to tell because we're not moving by much. We're really only moving by 10 mil, I mean meters, remember. Our bounds will tell us. We're moving as low as, as low as 20 mil and as much as 800 mil. If we want to amplify that a little bit so we can really see it working on the facade, we can do a little modification to these numbers, scale them up. And I'm going to do that by using a multiplication. 
I'm going to take the R values from the remap into A, and I'm going to put down a value like 2, and what that's going to do is double everything. Now we can see some of the points moving out of here. If I keep pulling that slider up, we can, we can really see them being displaced. This is a variable. I'm going to call that depth. That's more or less controlling our depth. Move it over to the left. You can see I did the same up here. It's really handy to have all your variables set up on the left. Now, we know something's happening, but it's pretty hard to appreciate what is actually happening there. So I'm going to then put down a, another component that's called surface from points. If you hover your cursor over, you can see that it allows you to create a NURB surface from a grid of points. Now we can put our translated geometry or our translated points into P. We want to create a surface from all these points, so we need to remember to flatten our list. Otherwise, we're going to have a series of rows and columns, and Grasshopper is not going to know how to turn that into a single surface. So, first of all, right click, flatten. Next, it asks for our number of points in the U direction, which means it basically it wants to know how many points we have in that direction. We can come over to our divide surface. We know in the U count we've put in 50, so we can just take that same slider and move over to U. Let's read the bubble. It shows red, so there's an error. And it tells us that the U count value is not valid. The reason for that is because we have asked Grasshopper to generate a surface with 50 points, but we know it starts at zero. So if it goes from 0 to 50, it means we actually have 51. An easy fix for that is on the input for U, if you right click and go to Expression, and in the Expression Editor, you go and type in X plus 1, and then click on Commit Changes, it's now happy. The reason we do it this way is if we decide to come back, and I'll do that now, I'll just change that to 20, that value will update our divide surface, but it will also then feed back into this U value, and it will always be that number plus one. So by adding an expression rather than adding in a new slider, it means that we can remain dynamic with our code. It's light gray, it's happy, something's happened here on the left, so I'm going to turn off the preview for these two. And now you can see we have a pretty wild and rifty surface. Let's bake that really quickly and see what that looks like. And run it. Okay. So it's done what we want, but it just doesn't look too pretty. And the reason for that is we have an image with a lot of information. I'm clearing up Grasshopper, I'm just going to control Z in Rhino and undo. This brings me to the last point for this exercise. It's being able to control your original image in Photoshop to be able to get smoother results. I'm actually going to bake that so we can keep a track. Um, we can keep track of what we're doing. So I'll move that over. And as a text. Input in Rhino, type in text, I'm just going to say um, original image. Open up Photoshop. Duplicate that image. And apply the layer mask filter. Blur, Gaussian Blur, and let's do a Gaussian Blur of around 5. 
smoothened out the edges a little bit. File, save as. I'm going to call this image2 Gaussian 5. And make that a JPEG. Go back to Grasshopper. Double click on our image. Click the link and let's relink image 2. Press OK and keep an eye on this screen here so you can see what's happened there. It's got a little smoother. Right click bake. Double click on the head to minimize grasshopper. Pull that out as a duplicate. Hold Alt and duplicate our text. Let's rename that to image 2. Gaussian Blur 5. You can either double click on the text and bring up this text editor. Or if you want to set it up the way I have it in my window, you just need to make sure you have your properties bar across here. And when you click on the text, there's a window here that allows you to so see. By default, you'll be on object. You just want to click on text. Let's do that once more. Photoshop. Make a duplicate. Uh, let's name this as well. It's always good to label everything. So if you have to go back and reverse engineer what you've done, you can. I'm going to duplicate the original. Apply the layer mask. Move that up to the top, rename that image 3. I'm just going to throw a number at it and say Gaussian 50. Let's go with 50. You can see it's really smooth now. All the colors have become one. File, save as. Let's call that image 3, Gaussian 50. Back to Grasshopper. Let's input that new image. And see now it's almost, well, it's entirely indistinguishable, but it still has blacks, greys, and whites, or at least the version of it, so we should get a result. If I bake that, you can see it's smooth right out. Make a duplicate. I'm going to call that image 3. 50. And obviously anything in between would work. So I encourage you to go back and test other values like 10, 15, 20 until you get what you want. Another variable that you can play with, aside from um, the color and the Gaussian in Grasshopper, I might go back to number 5, is the depth, the overall depth. We can make that nice and subtle. Go back and bake that. I'm going to move that in line with image 2, but behind it. And add a new line that is depth 4. And we should probably add one here that says depth 9. This is a great way to document your design development for your reports and for your submissions in Studio. Obviously, you can go to a um, change your display view to Arctic to rendered and that makes for a pretty nice diagram as it is but let's keep looking at the other variables we can change the count so we can reduce the resolution and as you do that you can see it starts to get a bit more bumpy and as you increase it, it becomes smoother We've got the depth and we've got the minimum and maximum 
which also controls the depth as well. But you can change it inverse. So keeping your minimum at zero will mean it stays on the facade. And this basically increases the value of your blacks and this increases the values of your whites. So if you want the white to stay, sorry, other way around, the black, see that little triangle is this guy up here. If you want that to stay flat on the facade, you keep it zero, and you can change the value of the white, or you can invert that. Keep the white on the facade and the black comes out. Or you can have anything in between, and this depth will just change them all as a more of a universal scale. few more minutes before we hit 20 so we'll just quickly show you how you can turn those into let's say horizontal louvers type in contour the shape to contour is our surface from points the contour start point in this instance that's perfect that starts at zero 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 you can see that highlighted down in the corner the contour direction by default is 0, 0, 1, which means uh, 0 in the X, 0 in the Y, and 1 in the Z. But just to make sure that isn't missed, let's put a unit Z down. And so that means we're going to cut our surface moving from 0 to 1. If you don't know how a contour works, you can also do one in uh, Rhino. Type in contour, select your base plane. Set your top plane and your distance in one meters. There's our contours. Or cross sections, if you like. And here it asks for the distance between the contours. Let's say 0 0.5. And there we have it. We have a series of squiggly horizontal lines. Let's copy and paste that and do the same for our original surface all the way back at the start and we can now loft the two together our top surface doesn't actually go doesn't get cut because of the spacing so we're saying half meter spaces and that must be missed by a fraction, so we can change that to, let's say, um, make that a round number and go to 0.49 for the sake of this exercise. I obviously haven't really considered my scale too much. I don't need that second distance because I'm going to use the same distance for the two, that way they're always in line. Off. Now you can see I have something up the top. The lower this number, the more louvers we get. And each of those louvers, again, recreate this pattern because the depth of that surface is generated by the brightness values on this image. We can take that one step further and give these panels or these louvers a thickness. Just type in extrude. B asks for the breadth or surface, sorry, the curve of surface, which is the result from our loft. The extrusion direction, so let's say we're going to extrude them up in the Z axis. By default, the input is 1, which is huge. Let's type in 0 0.01 for the thickness of our blade. And there we have a depth with a dynamic slider for how many we have on our facade. Don't go too low because you might crash your computer. And the resolution, so I can bring that down. Reduce the res resolution of the surface. You can see that we lose a bit of the depth and the curvature as we do that.
and select your extrude and hit the insert button on your keyboard and minimize the closed brass locker so you can see the facade. I'll turn on the rendered view. And there you have it. While I'm here, I might quickly show you a nice way to output images from Rhino. Just turn the sun off. A command called view capture to file is a great way to output some decent quality diagrams and images. So type that in, press enter. By default, this will be set to one. If you want a high resolution image, you can increase that. So three is huge, that's six, seven by three, five. Obviously that's a multiplication of your screen dimensions. I've got a 2K screen, which is why at scale one, it's two, two by one, one, ninety. You can choose to have transparent or not. You press okay. Save that to the desktop as a new capture. Example, and then I'll open that up in Photoshop so you can see that. Oh, I made a mistake. It has a black background because I forgot to set it as a PNG when I saved it. So if you are going to use transparent, make sure you set your file type as PNG. I can drop a white background. In this case, I had the Arctic on, so there's some um, shadows on the ground. So if I wanted to use this view, for example, it would have been fine because there's no shadow. If you don't know how to change your views up here in perspective in the drop down, there's a few preset options. But you can also play around and create your own, which I've done here. I've got a series of custom views. This one here puts lines down as a form of shading. Diagonal shadows. White lines on a grey background. So usually when I set them up for production for a job, I will often save them. There you go. See you in the next video.